My name is Sarah Maniscalco Robinson. Today is November 13th, 2021, and I am in Lenox, Iowa, technically. Technically. Address wise. Um, and I am interviewing Thomas Bradley. Uh, and in the room is also his wife, Debbie Bradley. Yes. Okay. Could you please tell me your first and last name? Thomas Bradley. Okay. And when and where you were born? I was born in uh, my aunt's house, my great aunt's house, in Creston, Iowa. And your birth date? January 19th, 1943. Okay. So you were born at home. I, that was pretty typical back it, then. It was at a house, mm -hmm. my, grand, my aunt, great aunt's house. Uh, did you have brothers and sisters? I have, I had uh, nine brothers and sisters. I'm the second oldest of ten. My oldest brother, Hub, has passed on just within the last year. Uh, there were six boys and four girls. Um, what kind of things would you guys do back then? Um, not to get in trouble, but what kind of things did kids do back in the 40s and 50s in Iowa? Where, where we lived, and and we lived on the farm. Um, I lived in. There were probably there there's three houses in this area that uh, that I lived in when I was young. Uh, other than the first place where my mom and dad lived was out northeast of Kent, and. Then, uh, I guess, well, I don't know what the, how many years later it was, they moved into a house uh, a mile down the road west of here. And they started farming the, uh, the property where we live now. And, and then, after a period of time, they moved to another house that's about a mile across the road across the uh, ground from this house uh, and that was up until I was uh, probably getting the years a uh, year from starting school and then uh, my uh, my grandmother Schiffer and her uh, husband they lived in this house when our family got to be greater than uh, that little house we were living in, they swapped houses. And that's where I've been living ever, ever since then and lived here until uh, I joined, joined the military from here. And then, uh, then we moved back up here quite a few years later uh, in time. Um, did you know anyone or have family members that were in the military before you joined the military? Um, I had an uncle that uh, he was in the Korean War mm -hmm. uh, and I think he's I think he's about the only one that I knew. Uh, I'm sure there was maybe some other relatives. I mean I, I was in a big family uh, and my dad and his uh, three brothers, one of them became a priest, and the other two uh, had large children, I mean large families, uh, and both of the other two had eight children. And my dad was the youngest of the, of the four. So, uh, so we had quite a few relatives on the Bradley side and the Baker side. Three Bradley brothers married three Baker sisters, so they they were. We have all all those relatives. Um, what kind of things would you do growing up to help out on the farm or work? Uh, chores. Uh, we were depending on. We were dependent on once we get old enough to do those types of things. We were responsible for doing the chores uh, a lot. Uh, especially during the harvest season when the planting was being done and the uh, when the 
harvesting was being done. Uh, we expected to make sure that we did the chores, but we also started very young at helping with those uh, chore, I mean with the crops, uh, uh, as far as hauling, the, uh, getting the corn into the corn cribs and oats in the bins and all those things. Do you think that later on in the military, your Iowa work ethic helped you be successful? Oh yes, Could it, you? it sure did. Uh, when, when I joined the military, I was older. I was uh, 21 years old when I joined the service. And uh, I wasn't there in boot camp very long before I became the company commander of the, of the, uh, the, the company that I belonged to. And uh, I would say that I guess all the work ethic and how I was brought up uh, benefited me. Where did you go to high school? I went to high school in Lenox, Iowa, mm -hmm. which is only seven miles from here. I went to grade school to a country school, which is in the opposite corner of the, the road across the street. Uh, did I pass it on the way? It's a white. You came road. down through, yes. And through Creston? Uh, if you came down through through the old camp, and mm -hmm. yes, uh, you passed our school. Hmm. Plat number nine. Yes, I do remember looking at it because I had a sign on it. Well, her and I put that sign up there. And she had a project that she worked on to try to put a sign and so, a sign just like that one for every uh, school that was in Union, uh, here in Union County. What year did you say you graduated high school? I graduated in 61, 1961. And then, then I attended uh, two years of college in uh, Kansas, where my brother had also gone to college in Kansas, uh, Highland Junior College in Kansas. And for what, uh, what studies? Uh, it was just general studies, but I majored in uh, football, <laughs> football and track. Yes. My my brother was also in that school at the same time because he was only a year ahead of me in school, and uh, his future wife was also going to school there, and she was she was in the same class he was. Um, so, did you join the military or were you drafted? I joined the military. Okay, tell me the story about that. Um, I kind of had the idea that uh, if I if I joined the service, that I would have maybe a better chance of getting educated uh, in whatever whatever I I wanted to, uh, you know, to to pick out the things that. I thought maybe looked good and, and that I would join. A little more control over your own destiny. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Um, well, when you decided to join, do you remember hearing about this thing called Vietnam? Oh, yeah. I, I knew about Vietnam. Um, wasn't really too much enthused about, you know, joining the Army. Um, but... Uh, I, I really don't, uh, I can't put a finger on why I chose the Navy, but, but, I, but I did choose the Navy or hope to join the Navy when, when I, you know, while I, while I was going to boot camp. Um, could you tell me again what year you joined the military? I joined, uh, let's see, I graduated from uh, junior college in 63, and I think it was shortly after that that, uh, no, I, I spent some time working on the farm for uh, one of the members of our church, uh, and I worked there, what was it, three, three years, I think, three or four years, uh, and then I during the week, I stayed at their house, 
and then uh, they were they also went to church with with uh, my family in Lenox. Even though you don't remember exactly why you joined the Navy, what kind of things did you like about it? Um, everything that I that I hear read about the Navy, uh, I felt that uh, they they had the better schools, I think, um, and that was one of the reasons why I joined, uh, where I was able to pick out, you know, the the uh, the schools that I might attend and, and that, that type of thing. What was your job? W when... In the Navy. In the Navy, okay. Uh, when, when I joined the Navy, I, uh, and I became, I was the company commander of our recruit company. Okay. Um, and then uh, after I got there, uh, I went to, uh, although I was selected. I forgot to ask where you did your basic. In San Diego. Okay. And, and uh, I, I was able to uh, select the school that, that I wanted to go to. And I went from San Diego to Long Beach, California as a primary school. I, I was supposed to be, they, they were supposed to have set up some type of a program where I could get some basic training in, in electronics because I was going to need that. Uh, <laughs> but they, did, they didn't do a very good job of uh, educating us any more than what we already had. Uh, so that that was in Long Beach and I was on Mine Squadron 11 at that time. So uh, we we didn't make any uh, deployments on the mine sweep boat or anything like that. So what was your first duty assignment after you were done with your training? Okay, uh, okay, I went from Long Beach to uh, to Treasure Island to my A school, okay. which was Electronics A school, ETA school, mm -hmm. because they had not developed any type of a CTMA school for us. Uh, so I, I, I attended that in uh, Treasure Island, and then from Treasure Island, I went to Bear Island as uh, more electronics. In, in that school and that's where I got my orders to the the ship um, from from Mare Island and I got uh, my ship or my education there in the solid state electronics where everything up to that point had been just general electronics. What is um, for someone who doesn't know a lot about electronics, what it, what does solid state electronics mean? That's the the miniature type components uh, instead of the big vacuum tubes that that, uh, that are in radios and things like that. And and like looking at the the, the radios that we have now, you can hold it in your hand. Uh, back then, one of the radi one of the radios that that we used. In the, in the field that I was in was a big radio about that wide and about that high. And then n numerous others, different sizes, and depending on what they were used for, whether it was you know, low frequency or high frequency, the lower the frequency, the bigger the components were, and things of that nature. Why was your job important? Uh, I would say that the job that I had, uh, repairing those pieces of equipment and everything, that was the basics for everybody else that was in the field that I was in. That I was in. We had, uh, there were six different fields in the CT uh, community, uh, and each one did their own thing. So I was a CTM, maintenance. So I fixed the the, uh, the equipment whenever it broke uh, and then the R branchers they were collectors of the material 
uh, of the what was used the radios for, um, and I I guess uh, like okay there were there were M branchers T A M O R and I uh, the I's were interpreters operators were the communicators. Uh, and the R branchers were the ones that collected the material. Uh, which one did I forget? I, th I think I got them all. T branchers also collected the material. The, the O branchers were the operators. They 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 were the communicators off on and off the base. Did you have the same consistent team every time that you did a mission? Did you have the same buddies that you would pair up with, or would you guys rotate out through that? Okay. Um, my first duty station, uh, first of all, after, after I completed my, uh, they did not have uh, a CTM A school, even though we went to the, to become CTMs. Um, we went to the electronics uh, A school, and then I went from there to the ship as a CTM. And, and they said, uh, you'll figure it out. Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, I, I went all the way through the A school that the, the other uh, ratings had for their A school, uh, which was electronics. So I, I reported aboard the ship as a, as a CTM-3. So that was an E-4. Uh, and I made E-5. Uh, I was was an E5 when the when the ship was attacked, but I, I had made E5 while I was there, and I found out that once I once I uh, went aboard the ship and may, extended my enlistment for a certain period of time, I could start collecting proficiency pay as a maintenance guy. So uh, so I extended my enlistment. And just kind of going back when when the uh, when the when the ship was hit or Exo was killed, I had extended my enlistment for three years. He signed my papers to that I would re-enlist to uh, for three years, and so then. <laughs> uh, Kind of going along with that, uh, he had he had signed my extension papers. Since he was killed, you know. Were they valid? Yeah. <laughs> You're like, well, oh, nobody would know. Yeah. Well, uh, but I mean, the fact that I was able to draw the proficiency pay for those for the. For the time, since you know, as soon as I uh, as soon as I signed those papers, uh, I was getting an extra amount of money, so uh, that that was to my benefit. Um, so was the Liberty your first tour then, or your the first yes. ship you were on? Yes, it was. Okay, can you tell me how those tours work? Um, how long you're supposed to be gone? That kind of thing. Um, because because of the type of duty the ship performed, um, I think we I made uh, I think three, four, four four different uh, deployments, and then uh, each time we came back in, we had to go to the shipyards to make add, maybe add something else that we needed for communications. Uh, <coughs> and so uh, the ship that I was on, well actually I went to another school, I went from Mare Island to, uh, to a school in, the, in the Fort Meade. And uh, we were, I think I ended up with another Another school before I actually before the ship actually got attacked, but um, uh, I went from 
I went to Norfolk, is where the ship was home ported. And uh, of course Deb was able to go with me when when we moved to Norfolk. And we were we were there when uh, when the ship was actually attacked later on, but uh, uh, but I had taken on two other different uh, pieces of equipment that that I was trained on, um, and the uh, I mean, what three three cruises? Three or four. I, yeah. Um, so you had mentioned earlier your ship's mission, but you didn't specifically say oh. what it was. So could you okay. tell me what ship you were on, what your mission was to kind of set up the story? You can yep. tell it now, the, the ship that I was on was the USS Liberty. That was my first ship and actually the only ship that I ever served on. Uh, and we were uh, responsible for, for collecting uh, signals, uh, and researching uh, other signals, uh, and I—I I was, uh, I guess the the first cruise that I was on, I was uh, responsible for a uh, for a piece of equipment that was uh, pretty high frequency type uh, piece of equipment, and the as we progressed on. To other cruises, I was uh, I was uh, responsible for a room of research uh, of collecting uh, responsible for the equipment mm. that collected signals from wherever, and uh, so I was not responsible for listening to any type of that stuff you know that we had like I said there, there's six branches of, of uh, CTs and uh, so the area that I was in uh, for most of the crews was the uh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> everybody called them a spy they were called a spy ship because because of all the stuff that we <laughs> that we collected but all you know I I had um, I couldn't tell you any of the stuff that I so was, nobody listened to. Talked to you about what they heard or saw. Everybody just kind of did their job. Yes. And yes. Didn't gossip about it later. Yes. And I can say, tell you that if if that had happened on my first cruise, I wouldn't be here telling you about it because my my uh, my position or where I was at during the first cruise was down in our maintenance shop. There was one guy down there. And the first cruise, I was the only guy down there. And when the ship got hit, he was he was the only person down there. So, uh, so um, I'd like to ask you a few questions about sea life, just yeah. uh, living out on the ocean and what that's like as someone who's never been. Ship. So, right. what, um, so from what I understand about ships, they have different classes. Yes. So what was the Liberty's class? Okay. There were five ships that were like the one that I was on. Mm -hmm. The AGTR, Auxiliary Technical Research, one, two, three, four, five. We were the fifth one. Um, and what the reason they were different. Uh, the auxiliary technical research is what we were we were directly involved in. Technical research, uh, and we could pick up just about any type of signal that was that was developed. And fancy word for spy ship. Yes, yes. Uh, they put uh, on, on our ship. They put. Uh, we had to go back in one time to uh, to get a brand new uh, piece of equipment installed on our ship, and I don't have it on one of those. Uh, it was called a big dish antenna that we could we could send a signal from our ship to the moon, 
and back to whoever I could, whoever could see the moon also. Uh, and I can, if you show it to me, like show and tell and point to it, I can um, look at it on the... All right. The, uh, okay, it's not on this one. This, this was my piece of equipment, the first cruise I went on. Okay, is that somewhat of like a satellite dish? Uh, this one wasn't. This was, this one was, uh, it could receive signals that are from, uh, from just about anywhere, uh, as long as, but it was, you could, you had to be able to, uh, move this antenna around this way and up and down, uh, depending on the type of signal that it was, uh, that it was drawing. Uh, Don't have one. The one from the moon. Do you have one, Tom? No. Well, you're not going to produce one. Right. Wow. Okay. Well, I like that one. That one tells. Uh, okay. The other one. Is this one shot up? Okay. That's it. Okay. Oh, okay. This this piece of equipment back here. Okay. Now you and. Right here. And this that's the, the one that goes to the moon? Yeah. That one that one was uh, moon relay communications. And if we could uh, as long as we could see the moon and whoever we were communicating with could see the moon, it would go to the moon and then back to Earth. Uh, or back to us. So and then the one that I started out working with was the one that was up here. Uh, and I see that one also says CTR5, so that's the same ship that uh, you just G showed me. GTR. GTR, okay. Yeah. Well, maybe I need to get my eyes checked. <laughs> <laughs> it, it probably uh, auxiliary technical research ship number five. So that was this one. And we used to, uh, we used to get some weird looks on uh we were we were there was about three or four of us that, that kind of hung together and we would uh you know we would go out during the daytime and uh look to see if the moon was shining you know and or uh we were trying to get the the antenna oriented towards the moon uh so that we could communicate with somebody and we had so many of the crew, ship's crew, that would come by that were been taking some trash to dump on the, fan, the over the fantail. And we, we, there was one day we was out there and we were trying to locate the moon so that we could kind of get an idea of where the antenna had to be and to look for it. And they said, what are you guys doing? I said, we're trying to find the moon. They look at you like, <laughs> you guys are weird. Uh, hey, what's that saying about uh, loose lips? Yes. <laughs> None of your business, yes. what we're doing. Yes. Loose lips sink ships. You communicated with Washington, D.C. that way. Yeah, we, we could. Um, there was certain times where it, it, was, it was two channels, and we could communicate with somebody back in the States and, you know, and sit there and listen to the World Series or something like that. <laughs> so, anyway. But never for personal gain, right? No, no. <laughs> um, so, I'd like to learn a little bit more about the living quarters, bunks, what kind of food you had, but most importantly, I'd like to hear how you took to sea life as far as uh, did you have good sea legs, or were you uh, sick at all? I I think the very first cruise I went on, uh, I got a little little sick, um, but the uh, the CTs had their own space area. The, the CTs and the uh, R branchers, mm -hmm. they're they're the communicators, uh, and then the ship's company was in the the forward part of the ship. So, uh, you know, they, they kind of thought we had better quarters than they had, but, you know, quarters I think were, were pretty much the same. What were uh, your quarters like? 
Uh, I had uh, I had a bunk that was probably about with with my bunk and the area under it was about like this. Uh, it was uh, big enough, long enough for you know any anybody that's real tall. You know they they could sleep in those. Uh, and our uniforms and things we had were underneath the mattress. We'd lift that up and. Uh, and then we had a we had a drawer in there that was uh, we could lock uh, to safeguard you know anything that we thought was valuable enough that somebody might want to borrow it also. So uh, um, I think it would be beneficial to be um, not six four. Probably not in that situation. <laughs> probably not. It'd probably be just about. Mm -hmm. Far enough. <laughs> um, so, how about food? What kind of food would they give you? Uh, we all ate the same thing uh, because the galley was in between the, the two birthing compartments, <coughs> and I, I never, I don't, I can't even think of anything that that they prepared that was not edible. You know, uh, I, I thought they did a pretty good job of, of feeding us good food. Anything that you had a lot of? Uh, I can't. I can't mention anything that I can think eggs. of that was was a lot. Well, uh, eggs were Potatoes. breakfast. <laughs> yeah, every day. Yeah. Um, so you weren't too picky of an eater. That's what you're saying. It, I wasn't. It got, it got the job done. I wasn't. Okay. Right. Were you able to keep in contact with back home um, in any way? Uh, we. By, with letters, you know, uh, I think we did a pretty good job of communicating back and forth uh, with with my family back home and and uh, Deb back in the back in the states. Uh, what was Debbie doing while you were in the service? Did she stay at the farm? No, uh, she she stayed in the quarters that we lived in in oh. in Norfolk. And was able to go with me uh, from day one. Uh, so you know. Did you guys have any kids yet when you had left? Uh, we had. We didn't have any kids when when uh, when we first started out. But so you were a good husband. You wrote letters. And she yes. wrote letters. Yes. How about care packages? Would you receive? Uh, I I think. I think anything that I purchased. You know, like for her, I think I kept that until we got back in port. Uh, the uh, everything else was, you know, just regular uh, mails. And of course, we always look forward to getting in port when we would get mail. Uh, um, did they have any or bring in any sort of entertainment for you onto the ship, or did you have to wait till you were? Uh, I don't think there was any, there was no entertainment brought onto our ship. Uh, maybe some of those bigger ships, you know, they might be able to, you know, have a big group, you know, a carrier or something like that, or the big destroyers or anything, but, but our ship was pretty compact. What would you do to pass the time when you weren't on duty then? Uh, we had a racetrack set up down in our shop. We we had uh, we were the, the lowest we were the lowest uh, deck on the ship that where there were people everybody else was you know above that uh, and we had uh, had a race car track you know a, a little you know the little race cars mm -hmm. like uh, the little metal ones yes mm -hmm. uh, we had those we had uh, ones that uh, we'd use to jump so you could make their car go the farthest, and, and uh, that was usually in our maintenance shop. That seems like nice, innocent fun. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, we we would, uh, depending on the night, you know, we might spend some time up on the deck, uh, you know, moonlit night, you know, just seeing what's going on up there. So, were you allowed to move pretty freely throughout the ship if you? Wanted to go up to the deck? Oh yes. Uh, the, 
I don't think there was as much where we went from from our spaces in the back. You didn't go up to the forward spaces where the ship's company would would be. Uh, and that's basically how we, we operated. And of course, you know, if there was uh, mingling, that would usually be done on the on the mess decks, you know, at night or you know, during meal time. Um, about how many people would be on the ship? Well, uh, over probably about 300 and so. That is uh, actually pretty small for a ship you hear the one yes. that holds thousands. Yes. Um, before we start talking about the day that we're going to talk about, are there any other stories, anecdotal stories about your time in service that you'd like to tell me about? Uh, I think probably, uh, like I said initially, that, that I had extended, so I owed the Navy uh, seven, seven years because I had my four-year original enlistment then I extended that for three, and I started drawing proficiency pay. Um, and I think from there on, um, everything was just, you know, we did our job. So did uh, you do the seven years, or did you do the four years? I, I was due to, to start the four years. Uh, when, or I, the three years, uh, when when the ship got hit, the the executive officer was killed, mm -hmm. and he's the one that signed my extension papers. Okay. So, then they had to figure out, you know, well, what are we going to do this guy? Uh, because they posted the list of the people that were going to get transferred off the ship back to Norfolk. And I went by there, and my, my name was on that first list. This good. So uh, I come by there a few days later, and my name's crossed off, and I'm on the last list that leaves to the ship. I went down to the personnel office. I went, what is going on here? And they said, uh, well, we have to re-enlist you before, before, uh, before you leave the ship. And... So, well, I said, okay, you know, I can go along with that. So that's, that's why I didn't get to go right away. And that re-enlisting canceled my, the extension that I had. And I re-enlisted for six years at that point because I enlist, I re-enlisted under a special program to get a school. So uh, they called it uh, STAR program, Selective Training and Re-enlistment. So I selected my school and all that. And uh, I forget now who actually re-enlisted me, but uh, anyway, what I did was I canceled mm -hmm. that extension that I had. So my, my new enlistment was six, six years from that day, you know, whenever I re-enlisted. And I, I got a pretty decent bonus for for that, yeah. and uh, at one point I, I was ready to cash that check when we got to New York and they were having trouble getting hold of a bus or something to to get us down to Norfolk. And I said, "Hey, I got this reenlistment check here. I'll cash that check, and we can use that and pr pay for the bus from Norfolk down or from uh, walk the wherever we were at. I think we flew into New York." From there down to Norfolk. I hope you didn't. No, I didn't. No, they they found they found money to do yeah. it. Yes. I don't think Debbie would have been really happy if you'd spent that check <laughs> all in one spot. Yeah, right. Yes, that's right. Yeah, I would have. I'd be very happy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because because that you know that wasn't the total bonus that I received. You know, it was just a portion of oh. it. So it wasn't like I was getting rid of the whole thing. So I'd like for you to tell me the story of the day that the Liberty was attacked. Okay. Uh, 
I'll start with a general quarters that we were practicing when and that what that that, means, that general day quarters. general quarters is where you go in case of attack or whatever. Uh, so we were at general quarters. The captain mentioned where he saw oil fields probably over on uh, the other side of the Mediterranean or whoever uh, the uh, whoever they were having battles with. Uh, and it was the Arab Israeli six day war. Yeah. Oh, can can you tell me that? Yes. That was that happened that 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 day was during or part of it was during the Arab Israeli Six Day War. And what year was that? Uh sixty nineteen sixty seven. Okay. And uh and what what body of water were you in at that We were in the eastern Mediterranean. Uh we used to The main places where our ship would go was all along this this part of uh, Africa. Can you turn it towards me? Just a, there we go. Perfect. There. Yep. Um, and uh, I'm thinking it was this one, uh, Luanda, Angola. Uh, we were in, and uh, we had our postal clerk. He, he said uh, one, one time when we were having lunch, you know, and he says, I've been on this ship so long I'll probably die on this ship. Uh, he was one of the people that was killed and, of course, died on the ship. Uh, so but anyway, we were, we were somewhere probably out in here. We weren't, you know, too close, but we were, we were in about as close as we could probably be. Uh, along the the west coast of Africa, and we had like I think there was five or six different ports that we pulled into at different times. <coughs> uh, Luanda, Angola was one of them, and uh, I think it was might have even been Luanda, where we were uh, we were in port, and. Uh, we were in port, and we were had we had reveille early in the morning. It was like, you know, if we if we normally got up at six, it was like four thirty or five in the morning, and reveille, you know, all hands, you know, make make, make preparations and get underway. And we thought, wait a minute, why are we getting underway? There must be something going on somewhere. So we did get underway, and that was when. Uh, I decided that uh, that I was going to go up to the main deck, and because the captain had mentioned that he could see oil fields over there, and the, uh, uh, that he could see that from the, from the ship. Uh, so I was going to go take a look at these battlefields, and that was that was when things started for for us. You know, we had already been up underway because we got underway and was actually moving on uh, I don't know where we were going but uh, you know we, we left the port that we were in and after the captain mentioned that, that he could see these oil fields I decided I wanted to go up and look at them look and see where these oil fields that he's looking at that uh, that were on fire or something so uh, this may be a little bit early in your story, but uh, uh, I went up to the main deck and I started walking down the, the, uh, the main deck on the side of the ship and I heard this noise that sounded like the, the uh, bosun mate was, and people that were working on the deck would use uh, uh, chip and hammers or you know something and it sounded to me like they were using an air chipping hammer. And of course I could hear that pounding the metal and everything. And uh, so I figured hey, they're, they're using a chipping hammer to uh, get the paint off of it. And then they're going to paint it. So I proceeded on to my 
general quarter station and then we were we were put into general quarters for that and that was the first time that I, I was down there at my at my general quarter station and and I had one piece of equipment that I was responsible for and uh, I got an itch in my back so I reached back there to uh, scratch my back and pull it back and had blood all over my hand. Uh, some of that shrapnel that they were shooting with their planes, uh, a piece of that had hit me in the back. And, and it was bleeding, of course. I, I didn't even, you know, I didn't even feel it uh, because of, you know, I was, I was running to get to my, my uh, general quarter station. So, uh, uh, and I, that was the only thing that, that I could think of that, uh, that happened was a piece of that shrapnel that they were shooting, you know, a piece of it hit me in the back and made me bleed, but it wasn't, you know, it didn't last long. Uh, I never went to sick bay to have it looked at, which, you know, they basically told us we should, uh, but I didn't. I didn't go to sick bay. I'd have got a purple heart for it and you know, another. I'm glad now that I didn't uh, because, uh, well, I'll tell her another story regarding that thing in my, in my back. Uh, I was stationed in Winter Harbor, Maine and I was due to re-enlist. And this, I had been having a little problem in, in, with my back. Just whatever, I don't know. So I went to sick bay for, about five for my re-enlistment and uh, I, I told the re-enlisting officer, the, I mean the, the doctor that did my re-enlistment physical, I told him about this uh, shot that I had got hit in the back when, when the planes come over uh, and uh, she uh, she x-rayed my back, you know, where I told her that uh, I had the problem with and, and uh, she didn't find anything. My back started <laughs> feeling okay, it never bothered me since. Uh, I, I don't know whether it was all, you know, my stupid head <laughs> or something. <laughs> but, uh, but I had two minors like that. Um, the other one was when, uh, when, the, when the torpedo yeah, uh, something grazed me right, right across here on one of my eyes, uh, and I took my hat off. You know, I could see blood on it, but uh, that one, it wasn't serious enough for me to go medical. Did the attacks? Oh, first of all, what was the date of the attack? June eighth. Okay, and who was it that was attacking your ship? Uh, Israel. Um, did it all happen on one day or did yes. it last a while? No, it was that, just okay. that one day. Okay. So you were in general quarters. When yes. you were up on the deck, did you see anything or hear anything? That, like any planes going overhead? No. Uh, or any other ships because where the torpedo would have come from? When, when I was up on, on the deck, I was I was on the outside, I was walking along the side of the ship. It'd be like, uh, like where I would have been walking would have been on the opposite side of the ship. Uh, but I was, I was actually coming across this area right here. Uh, yeah, I was going this way. And that was, that was where I was at when when that uh, piece of shrapnel or whatever it was that the, the planes were flying uh, were, were shooting at us at that time. That was, that was the first time. And then the second one, I don't know when I got that. But it was later that it, same it, day. It was later that same day. Uh, well, I don't know if it was, if it was when the, when the, uh, when the torpedo actually hit. Uh, 
something got me just right above my eyebrow. And everybody, you know, when we got back to the States and they said, well, you probably was drinking coffee, you know. <laughs> How did you know that a torpedo hit him? Uh, by then, it was very obvious that a torpedo hit because, well, I'll tell you that uh, when the torpedo hit uh, and where it hit, after everything was all dead and said and done with, where I was standing, I could look out the side of the ship. And when I left the space that I was in, I was walking in water up to my knees and back. The fact that I'm acting that way about my hit <laughs> that got me to uh, got me to uh, do a medical procedure in Mount Air compared to one in Des Moines <laughs> because I. It, I had trouble explaining that to my the doctor I was with down in uh, Mount Air here, okay. and and uh, he told the doctor that I was supposed to go see in Des Moines uh, what had happened, and they went along with it, and so I didn't have to go to Des Moines for that procedure. I was able to do it in Mount Air, which they could That's do it. Good. So. Uh, there's there's just times, different times when I uh, when I want to tell somebody something about the 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 attack that uh, I get to the point where I can't. Well, it'd be a scary day. Yes. Out in the middle it, of the it ocean. Was, it was. It mm -hmm. was. Yes. It does make make it easy to joke about it a little bit, though, doesn't yes, it? Yes. Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. uh, because you know we thought. We thought the way that the ship was, well, 25 by 39 feet uh, is how big the hole was, you know, and then it started out up on the top, you know, like this, and then went like that. Uh, and like I said, the space that, uh, the, the bottom space that we had, if, it, if that had been my first cruise, I wouldn't be here talking about it, uh, because the main blast was inside the shop that I, where I, worked the first cruise that I was on. That was my general quarter station. And uh, that was the only way that uh, we knew that there was that one guy down there and it, would, it took us a long time before we found him. And he was, uh, he was in, the, in the shop where uh, when the torpedo blast hit, it just opened up everything like that. And, uh, and then uh, we were we was able to uh, help one of th the sister was it of Margraf? Yeah, Dwayne Margraf. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he was the only one down there in the shop, and of course, when the torpedo hit, you know, it went like that, and most of it went this way, and he was piled up in all this rubble that was that was in the, in our shop. And when we had our first reunion in Washington, D.C., uh, we happened to be at the, at the table with this guy's sister and was able to tell her. I bet that was pretty special for her to find out. Yes. The story. Yes. Put some closure yeah. to it. Yes, it was. And... It was just fortunate, I guess, that we were we were supposed to do that. Mm -hmm. She came specifically to the reunion to find out what happened to her brother. And yes. you were and previously you got to tell her that you were the one that went looking for him, dug through the rubble, and you didn't quit until you found him because yes. you knew he was under there. Because you had previously had that as your general quarter, so you knew your way around that oh, oh, yes. specific yes. area of yes. the ship. 
and it was it was probably only a room about this big, and they just took the whole thing and just piled it up into the corner. So I know you guys took on water, but she stayed afloat. Yes. Right. Okay. So what kind of things did you guys have to do in order to not sink? Uh, well, you can see from this how far you can see from this how far the ship went over. So on, that's all, what is that that we're looking at? That this this is this is the the uh, oil and stuff that was in the ship. Uh, and it went and, down. And it down from the ship was laying like this. And, it, and when they leveled it out a little bit, uh, then you can see, you can see where the oil, mm -hmm. oil line came up on Did the side of the ship. Did you say you were in that picture somewhere? Um, uh, I think. Uh, or was it the I, other I, side? I, well, it's the other side, but it's the same picture. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, it's just labeled on the other side. Yeah. That was, uh, I think it was me right here. I was this guy right here. That real still for me for one minute. Let me zoom in. Okay, point to it for me one more time. Right there. Okay, kind of looking down. Yes. Yep. Okay. And I think this was probably. I think this was probably when we were pulling into the dry dock. Okay. To uh, to let all the water out of it and everything, and if you if you look at this. Uh, what, uh, oil and things like that makes comes rise to the top of the water. So when they pulled into dry dock and started run, letting the water out of it, uh, oil just covered everything. The clothes that we were wearing to uh, to clean up. And you have that picture. Is that the other picture? Is that oil yes. that's on your faces in that picture? Yes. Yes, ma'am. And you said you're in this picture also? I'm in I'm that guy right there. <laughs> kind of hiding in the back, aren't you? Yes. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm just leaning up against the bulkhead because this is a solid bulkhead okay. here. Yep, just hold that up for me. Um, give me one second to zoom out. And all that is just oil from? Yes. That's, and then tell it, me, you said that, what are you guys taking a break from in that photo? Well, we're, we're taking a break from being down there because, see, you can see everybody that has a soda or something here. Mm -hmm. uh, and there, we're taking a break. And I think this was the one that we were at when one of those admirals came aboard and did his inspection and all that. and. Uh, stepped into one of those and and uh, told us that uh, we didn't need to talk to anybody about this if you if you can if you do you know it could be prison or maybe even worse why do you think he said that try to get us to shut up so we wouldn't tell anybody anybody yeah but now after the fact now that you're an adult why do you think he told you politically because they were they were, I guess, uh, in sympathy with uh, President Johnson, who called back the planes that were dispatched to help our our ship, and he call, had them called back to the carriers. Yes. Do you know why? Because he. He basically said something to the effect that you know Israel is is our friend and uh, I, I don't know what all yeah. And he didn't want to didn't, start. Didn't want to didn't want to start anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so so he he had him called back. Do you know how many crew members were lost that day? Uh. Well, uh, that at this point, um, we we didn't know how many were down in the spaces because this whole this whole area where this hit was the the spaces that were the CTs, the cryptologic people, 
uh, where, where they worked. Uh, there was one person in the, uh, in the compartment ahead of the one that I was in. We'll say that, we'll say that this is the, say that, that this, this wall over here was the wall between the space that we were in and the communication space, which was on the other side of that wall. There was actually only one person made it out of that space alive only because he had gotten hit with a bullet, one of the bullets that had been shot by the torpedo boats because they fired guns at him. I mean, they fired guns at us. And he had gotten hit in the leg or foot, I believe it was, by one of those shells that penetrated the side of the ship and, and hit him. So he was actually, he had come out of the space and was on his way up out of the space where where I was uh, and on his way to sick bay to get treated uh, and like I told you before I I was uh, walking in water when uh, when I started to get out of the space I was I was going to walk from where I was uh, yeah, yeah, you couldn't see anything, but I knew where I was at, that I could walk across this room to that wall right there, and then here was a door that would have been like that door, and I could get to this wall, I would feel my way across there, make it to the door, and then on the other side of that wall was a ladder that led out of that space up like that. And I started, you know, stumbling over everything and all that. Yeah, why was it so dark? There was no light. They, they got rid of the... I mean, they shot the lights out. And, and there's no windows. And there's no windows. No. It was just... Sea level. It's like this whole room here. If you, you know, if, if it was nighttime and you shut turn off locks, you don't know where... So I was able to... <coughs> I was able to... Uh, make it across that room, stumbling over everything that I could think of. And I knew there was a wall there that I could go and find that wall. And what I found out later, all the stuff that I was stumbling over was that wall. And the first thing I ran into was that ladder. So I was able to then know that in order to get out of the space, then I just have, the ladder was still intact. You know, it was not uh, blown down or anything like that. The it was it was still in that space. So that that was in how I got out of that space. I made it up that space and uh, met that other guy that was trying to get to sick bay. I helped carry him partially way to sick bay, and then went on up to the uh, to the med to the mess decks, which is where the Sick bay was being held, and uh, and then on I went on out to the, the I went up one more deck to outside, and that was where the the uh, postal clerk was receiving uh, uh, medical attention, and he ended up dying. Was it that something hit the mail room? Was he in the mail room when it happened? Or? I would say, I would say probably that that he was uh, wasn't in the mail room because there wouldn't have been any. He probably had a general quarter station that was not associated with being in the mail room, uh, uh, but he was in a in a space where he got hit pretty bad and. Um, the space <coughs> where you had water up to your knees. Is that as high as the water went? Or no. if you had waited there, it would have gotten higher? Uh, that compartment, that compartment completely flooded. So you were uh, wise to evacuate that area? Yes. There, I mean, there, there, were, there was a lot of people that, uh, like I said, the, the space on that side of the, the wall were all the, uh, the people that uh, 
were communicators uh, and any of the maintenance guys that were in there. Uh, and they, there was only that one person made it out of there alive. And then on that side of the ship, there was probably maybe only two or three of the people that was where their general quarters station was on that side of the ship. Uh, there was only about two or three guys that made it out of that side of the ship. Did you ever find out, even all these years later, what instigated the attack? I, th I think, and I'm just, you know, reading some of the, the books and things, that uh, uh, the Israelis did not want us to know what they were doing. And so they were going to wipe us out. And that's, I think, what most of the people that, that was on the ship knew that that's what happened. And like I said, there was there was uh, planes that were sent to our assistance, and Johnson had them called back. How did you end up being done with it? How did you get away? Uh, first of all, we were told that uh, we were we were told that we you know we wouldn't we weren't supposed to talk to anybody about it and and all that and you know there was an admiral that, that came and talked to us at that time but uh, I I just don't think they probably went along with you know uh, not wanting the world to know what it, what it was what it was all about that they wanted us to be night. quiet. Mm -hmm. We sat there all night long and no one came. Yeah, yeah. We we didn't we didn't have anybody. There, nobody, no other ship came to our protection until the next morning. Were you guys like your were your engines incapacitated also, so you couldn't go anywhere? Uh, no. They, the the blast was just forward of the engine room, uh, and otherwise, yeah, we'd have, if it had got the engine room, we would have probably gone down. Um, and then you had mentioned something earlier about your follow-on duty stations of the entire crew. Can you tell me that story? Uh, you mean just where where everybody went? Yeah, yeah. it seems like they they all. They got scattered. I don't think there was any two, uh, any two that uh, of the crew that was on the ship that got stationed together. And I, I think we, I was one of those that that didn't that didn't happen because the uh, the division chief was my division chief was Stan White, and he uh, he was stationed in Morocco. And we got sent to Morocco after I finished uh, probably the thing that, that helped me from not getting stationed there uh, was because I had re-enlisted for ET Electronic Technician B School. And so I was in that B School for about a year before I got transferred anywhere. And I, and I got sent to a, another school down in Texas for our, for our ship's clock, or any of the duty station's clock, and then to Morocco. And that's where my division chief on the, on the ship was, was, was stationed, yeah. And you know, he, he left pretty quickly after that. Um, how many years did you spend in the military altogether? 27 and a half years. Okay. That's a lot of stories. We could go on for another hour. <laughs> yes. What was your highest rank achieved? E9. Okay. Uh, what is that called in the Navy? Uh, Master Chief Petty Officer. Okay. And I, I did, I was, uh, I was the Command Master Chief at uh, two different stations. Uh, was, uh, I was stationed in, in Scotland as a Master Chief, but I wasn't the Command Master Chief. I thought I was going to get to go there as the Command Master Chief, but I'd you know, I didn't. I didn't get that. And then uh, Scotland, we went to. 
yeah, Adak, Alaska. And I went there as the command master chief. <laughs> I've been there just once, and I was yeah. only there for three we, days. we did two tours on Adak, and thoroughly enjoyed both of them. Um, so I know that you're going to have a lot of answers for this one, but what kind of life lessons did you learn from being in the military? If you're in a position where you're not the boss, and you're one of the people that works, uh, if if you're told to do something, do it. You know, uh, I don't. I can't think of any anything that that I did while I was in the military that uh, that I was told to do that that I, you know, didn't cooperate or didn't do it because I didn't want to or whatever. What would you say or advice would you give to a young person who's considering joining the military? Um, basically just what I said. If you're told to do something, do it. You know? uh, and if you, know, if you, you object to it, maybe uh, you, know, you might have some reason why you you didn't want to or shouldn't, then maybe you need to let somebody know. But uh, for the most part, if you're told to do something, do it. Um, are you proud of your service and why? Because of the success I had in the military. Um, my last two commands, I was the Command Master Chief, the top E9 at the duty station, uh, uh, was uh, uh, ADAC and then uh, Pensacola, Florida. So you've seen the world. A lot of it, mm -hmm. yes. What do you think was one of the highlights of something that you saw that you thought was amazing on this earth? I think one of the, one of the duties, that, or not really the duties I had, but uh, you know, I, I talked about the one piece of equipment that we were associated with, where if we could see the moon, they could communicate with anybody else that saw the moon. Uh, I think that would be amazing. Uh, one of the other things was the, the school I went to in uh, Texas was a clock school, and all the all the people on at every one of the bases used the same clock, same type of clock. And uh, when we were uh, when we went to Morocco and I was in the maintenance shop and at, at one time just about every time this one uh, duty section came on watch uh, the clock had to be changed and we finally found out what happened was some one of the young whippersnappers went to the Navy Exchange and bought himself a wristwatch that was close, close to such and such a time. Uh, and so when he came on watch, oh, the clock's not right. And he would ask that the clock be changed. <laughs> and after a certain period of time, we found out that it was happened when this one duty section, whenever they had the watch, the, the clock would have to be changed. And of course, I had to go change it. And then we find out that what happened was that this this one particular probably some sailor, young officer. <laughs> no, it wasn't an officer. It was it one of the junior guys? Who, <laughs> he he got to his division chief or whatever it was and had him change <laughs> change the clock. <laughs> uh, was there anything else that you wanted to talk about, or stories you wanted to tell me that I didn't think to ask? <sighs> Uh, I I really can't think of anything that. Uh, what What do you think? 
What, what do I need to tell her? <laughs> I know that since your boys thought that your military lifestyle was wonderful and they had the time of their lives at every duty station. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I, my, uh, my second oldest son, he's retired from the Marine Corps. And I have another, uh, another one of our uh, nep nephews. Um, he's he's in the uh, he's in the Coast Guard. No, that's your grandson. You have two grandsons. Grandson, two grandsons, and and one's in the Coast Guard, and one's in the the. Uh, uh, Air, yeah, Air Force. Yeah. And then we lost a daughter. No. Our, uh, our oldest daughter, we were stationed in Pensacola. Um, and we had a Halloween party. And she got run over by, the, by a hayride. Uh, she fell off or she got pulled off, I guess, and run over by a trailer. Accident. Accident. Mm -hmm. And she's buried in uh, Barrancas National Cemetery in Pensacola, so obviously that, that's where we're going to be buried. So it's a, um, a national cemetery. Yes. Like yes. Wow, I didn't know that they did um, children. Well, in they, they did uh, because, I mean, I mean, if we had been in Pensacola, it would have been very easy for her to be buried there. But uh, uh, when we were stationed in Pensacola, when it happened, and uh, because she was a dependent, uh, we were able to have her buried in the National Cemetery in Pensacola. Um, so what year did you retire? Uh, let's see. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you. I can't think what was the question. What, when did I, what, what day did I retire? Oh, um, after well, like January 1st, 1991? Probably, that yeah. Good? That sounds good enough. Sounds yeah. close to me. You, you enlisted in June of 1964. Yeah. yeah. Well, unless you have anything else, I'm going to stop recording. Um, I, I don't have anything else that I can think of right now. Probably think